Hello and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you have sent me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com or have left comments or rather questions in the comment section of my Q&A videos and I will pull those questions and put them in my queue as well. So, hey guys, welcome to the show again. Very happy to have you invite me into your home. And I just wanted to say very quickly, in terms of announcements or anything like that, we have part two of the Sensibly Speaking podcast posted yesterday, which was part two of the emotional needs, uh, cults and emotional needs. My talk with Rachel Bernstein about the breakdown of the nine categories of emotional needs that we all have. Can't get away from them, can't escape them, can't deny them, although many people try. Uh, they are simply there, and they must be fulfilled in some fashion or another. And this is one of the major reasons why, um, or ways, that cult leaders and, um, and abusive uh, uh, narcissists, people in bad relationships, things like that, this is one of the key ways that, they, that people will uh, manipulate you is by manipulating you through your emotional needs. So if you understand what they are and understand that you have them and understand how they manifest in your life, both good and bad in, in, in lots of different ways, then you're going to be much more in the driver's seat when it comes to how people try to manipulate you. So I hope you will check out uh, part one and two of those podcasts with Rachel, and we will have a part three in a couple weeks to finish that off. All right. And I also wanted to put a plug in for uh, support of this channel and support of this show. Uh, I do this every week. I do a podcast every week. I have uh, new video content coming up that I am working on right now on emotion. I've got a whole, um, uh, the tone scale, Scientology's tone scale video. I've got a whole bunch of research. This paper I'm sort of waving about here right now is um, 92 different definitions of the word emotion. Uh, through the uh, through the years of psychology, and uh, and this is just one paper I'm reading and doing the research on this. Uh, it is an intense and very deep and very convoluted topic, uh, emotion. And Hubbard didn't get it right. <laughs> His tone scale is complete nonsense. And I'm making a whole video to break all of that down for you guys. That's the very next big thing I'm working on right now. And I am flat out on it. So uh, good times with that. So I wanted to, again, put a plug in to support the channel through Patreon uh, or through PayPal. And I am also including now a link to my uh, Venmo account down below. I've, I just opened up that. So if you want to send me some love that way, you can. And I would very, very much appreciate it. And it is what keeps the lights on and keeps the show going. Really, this is 100% fan supported by you guys, uh, my critics. So that all being said, let's get on with your questions. Giving consideration to the fact that he is now over the age of 60 years old, and better yet, I'd only assume isn't in a marriage that has been going well too, I think it's safe to say that Mr. DM is going to die without having any children to be the father of whatsoever. I believe in contrast from other siblings whom you've likely heard already have in fact become parents of some of the late Ron Miscavige's grandchildren. Now, of course, I'm aware that progeny isn't an encouraged idea for members in Scientology or the Sea Org to be precise. While at the same time, it also figure that an attitude of concern for future generations or even a sense of altruism are things Mr. DM may likely be completely devoid of. Now, it's one thing for someone like Mike Rinder to have been among the select few to have been close with Mr. DM, yet had also been a recipient of his hostility and abuse. So I hope you do not mind if I ask you, Chris, if you could take a guess when it comes to Mr. DM. How do you think he feels about the fact that a man such as himself will remain without having fathered any children of his own, as I truly wonder how he'd actually respond if he was asked about that in a sincere conversation by Tom Cruise? Okay, well, thank you for this question, and I will give you a direct, straight, and totally honest answer. Um, first off, I really don't know, but my subject, you know, my, my, my supposition here is that, is that Miscavige is somebody who can have anything he wants. He has the means and resources to do whatever he wants and, and certainly the freedom to do it. So if he wanted to have kids, if he wanted to make kids a thing for himself in his life, it would be nothing for him to do it. It would be easy. 
If he wanted to make kids a thing for the Sea Org, he could do that. Just like that. It wouldn't be anything for him to set up nurseries, childcare, invest some money and resources and time into indeed creating a future, you know, set of of generations for the Sea Org. But that would all require sincerity on his part. Honesty, transparency, right? Care, empathy, emotion. <laughs> and Mr. DM, as you call him so cutely in your question, <laughs> has none of those things. He doesn't care about other people. You understand? This is a man who just doesn't see other people the way you and I do. They are playthings to him. They are pawns. They are toys. They are, they are things to be influenced and manipulated and uh, and maybe, maybe at the very bottom of that, you know, is a whole lot of, of terror and scared. You know, they, maybe he's very frightened of, of other people or what they might do to him if, you know, if they had their way or this kind of thing. You know, he could be an intensely paranoid person. We, kind of hard to tell except for the way he lives. <laughs> you know, he's pretty, he lives a pretty paranoid lifestyle. Uh, so... Clearly, um, given all of that is what, sort of what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking if he wanted kids, he could have them. So he clearly doesn't want them. Uh, or he's got fertility issues, which have never been talked about or come up because it might not actually necessarily be something anybody else knows about. I mean, that might be the sort of thing he would hold very close to the vest. On the other hand, maybe he had a vasectomy years and years and years ago, and he just isn't having kids because he didn't want them. I mean, there's so many possibilities here. But the bottom line is that if he wanted to meet, have him. And so um, so the fact that he doesn't indicates to me very, very clearly that he has no desire to have, uh, you know, children. And my, my take on this is, um, you know, it's funny, Hubbard wrote about attitudes toward children as a whole chapter of the book Science of Survival which had to do with emotions and the tone scale, right? Which is why it's in my face these days. And in that chapter, he talked about how people in the 1-1 one, one band, the covert hostility band of the tone scale, the, the part where uh, people are being uh, perverts and sadists and you know all that irregular sex stuff that now is kind of culturally acceptable and back in the 50s was completely not acceptable. So Hubbard put all of that activity into this band of emotion called covert hostility, or 1.1, on his tone scale. And uh, included in there was uh, some writing uh, about how people in that band deal with or think about children. And I think Hubbard was, was writing right out of his own head here as far as how he thinks about them. When he said that that people in this band will regard children as playthings or toys or objects or things to own, rather than as something you know another human being that you are you know raising and growing and and preparing for life in the world, you, you know children are not objects and they're not possessions. They are human beings and they're not adults in little bodies. They are children, and they have to grow. And it's the you know it's obviously the responsibility of parents to see that they grow safely and securely and um, and hopefully with some morality and some and some ability to think through problems and things like that. That's the duty of a parent, right? It's not to consider children as objects or possessions. And this is where, uh, for example, the podcast I did a couple of weeks ago with Anna Dow so clearly showed that when uh, even outside of a Scientology context or a Sea Org craziness, out in the big wide world, like in the evangelical world, for example, it's a dogmatic belief that children are basically animals that you break, like a donkey or a dog or a, you know something like that or a horse. They, they, that's how you should treat your children. They, they're, they're possessions that you own, and they are they are there to serve your whims and desires. Not you're not there to you know really take care of them. This is Mike and Debbie Pearl's attitude about children, and. Um, and so you have some very, very psychotic kind of thinking about kids out there because you have people who are psychotic, who write about this and talk about this and, and, and profess that this is the way that, you know, children should be dealt with, is that they should be dealt with as though they are animals or as though they are objects. And um, I don't know that David Miscavige thinks this way, bringing it back around to your question, um, Mark, but... I think that um, I, I think another way that you could think about kids 
that I think is probably more in line. I'm again, I'm just guessing here, but with Miscavige, I think he's. I I, I don't. I, I think he's made uncomfortable by children. I don't think children are 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 not things that are easily controlled, and children don't have a don't provide a person like David Miscavige much return on investment. Like he, you know, you sink money and resources and time into kids, and you don't really get a whole lot back as far as he's concerned. And look, and and why I say this is look back to the history of kids in the Sea Org. Through the 70s and 80s, children grew up on the ship around Hubbard. They were his original messengers. Um, they grew up uh, at the bases. They had nurseries and what were called cadet orgs where they raised kids in the Sea Org. And most of those kids were not successful Sea Org members who went on to become, you know, amazing Sea Org. They left. They were wild children. They were not raised and cared for properly. They were relegated to, you know, the, the trash heap, basically, as kids. And an entire generation of these Sea Org kids were, were just, you know, raised very, very abusively. So, um, so Miscavige looks at stuff like that, just like he looks at Dianetics marketing campaigns or the Mission Network or things that actually could have been and for a while it, it seemed to be successful, seemed to have return on investment, in other words, seemed to be producing something back for Scientology that was a good thing. But then they destroy it. They mess it up. They screw it up. And then they blame the thing, right? Oh, those mission holders were all the evil, horrible thing that was wrong with Scientology that back in the 80s, right? Or those kids. Yeah, look what happened when we tried to raise those kids. Look, look what happened, right? Screw that. We're not ever doing that again. And so, you know, I don't want to hear about kids. Don't don't bring kids to me. And now kids are, are just, you know, kind of bleh in the Sea Org and in Scientology. So... So I think it's that kind of approach to 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 kids is where he's coming from on that. And that's, you know, and that's that's my best take on it. I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, Miscavige could be a bit of a sadist when it comes to kids. I, I just don't, you know, that's that's the best I can give you, though. So um, there you go. Jesse Davis. Hi, Chris. What would you say the mix was in the Sea Org among liberals and conservatives? Or were politics even discussed at all? Furthermore, what's your thoughts on the fact that liberals and conservatives can share the same religion? They seem to have moral disagreements on many issues, environment, LGBT, immigration, etc., yet somehow can come to an agreement on divine doctrine. How is that possible? Okay, well, you know, it is kind of interesting how religion and politics or, you know, ideologies seem to be aligning more and more, and there's divisiveness on these on these lines or around these grounds, but... I think, you know, I think we talk about that more than it's probably like, you know, some burning issue at every church or synagogue or place of house of worship around the United States, you know. As far as, um, okay, so as far as the Sea Org goes, liberals and conservatives, yeah, it's really not talked about very much politically. Uh, there's not a lot of political banter. There's certainly not a lot of political uh, argumentation within the Sea Org, uh, because the Sea Org sets itself above the fray, right? They're superior to all of that. They're not, you know, they're not involved in that stuff. They, the liberals are nuts. The conservatives are nuts. They're all nuts. Look at this system that they're, that they're uh, supporting. Look at this world that we live in that's falling apart, right? I mean, blah, blah, blah. It's all about the negativity of everything. So, the Sea Org is the only group they believe that is actually bringing some degree of sanity and and organization with you know with Scientology's organizing boards and all that stuff. So they they tend to put themselves above all of this rather than get into big deep arguments about it. Now, I mean, not once did I ever uh, see or hear anybody arguing about abortion rights or civil rights or any of that stuff. Uh, in the Sea Org, right? Our attitude was always, well, we've got the way to happiness. We've got the, 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 the superior moral code. We've got the superior technology to make people better. So we, we're the masters of the game. Those guys just need to catch up to us. Um, yeah. And then as far as uh, the broader question you're asking here, though, about how can conservatives and liberals share the same religion— well, easily. I mean, quite obviously they do. And yet they don't necessarily do so at the same churches, as I sort of was mentioning at the beginning. They're, they're kind of, 
dividing up, uh, you know, geographically and therefore um, denominationally, I guess you could say. So, um, you know, for example, evangelicals are pretty classically very staunch conservatives, even Christian nationalists, and and that gets very right wing, right? Whereas, um, you know, but you can also have on the on the left coast, you also have you know Christian churches and denominations and and organizations that people belong to for religious purposes that are very, very progressive in their values and interpretations. And, and really, it comes down to that word, interpretation, right? The evangelicals on, you know, on the right and the, the progressives on the left are reading the same Bible, but their interpretations of that scripture can be wildly different. And, um, you know, if you were to go with a literal interpretation of the Bible, as, as many in America do, um, you can have a whole lot of trouble real fast, right? Because there's a lot of nonsense in the Bible. Um, you can have a more liberal interpretation of it, a less literal, and, um, and it starts becoming a bit more metaphorical and allegorical, and you can kind of think with this in a different way. And it's not so staunchly, this is how it is, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And, you know, you are going to be cast down into the fires of hell and this kind of thing. You know, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, so you get these, you, you know, so how do you have this? Well, you have the same religion manifest in thousands of different ways all across the United States. That's how you have it happen. And it's, you know, it's, it's just different brands of, of tribalism that are all under the same umbrella of Christianity or Protestantism or evangelicism or, or you know, whatever words or labels you want to slap on that. Um, and that's, that's kind of how it happens. I mean, if you were to look at the breadth of political difference or the spectrum of, of political or social value differences, even in a group uh, like the Mormons— Right? It's a large group. I mean, they are, there are legit lots of Mormons. And you could look at that spectrum and see liberal Mormons and conservative Mormons, yet they all subscribe to the Book of Mormon as the ultimate truth. Right? So it's compartmentalization of belief and ideas that we all engage in, categorization and compartmentalization, and it is... Um, the fulfillment, again, of emotional needs, right? If a religion can answer certain questions for a person that answer their need for community, their need for uh, value of self or sense of self, um, for their future, for emotional attachments to others, if that, if that religion fits that bill for that person, the politics of it or the politics of other members isn't necessarily the big thing there, right? That's not what they're going to church for. That's not what church exists in their life for. So it might not necessarily always be as big of a factor for lots and lots of people as it is for, for some people. So, you know, that's that's kind of what I can say about that That's uh, that I think is sensible. I know it's really broad and, and not particularly helpful, but that's, uh, that's, what, I, that's what I got. <laughs> Kelly G., I'm working my way through your back catalog of Q&As. You mentioned in number 88, in an answer to a question, that there were only a couple of people that you had not been able to forgive since leaving the organization. It's been a while since that Q&A. Have you now forgiven those people? Did working your way through your master's program help? Hey, Kelly, thank you for this question. This is, a, this is an interesting one. Um, because thinking back to that handful of people that I, as I still had uh, grudges against, I still do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we're talking about three or four people. And I'm not going to name names. These are people who are, who are probably still in the Sea Org, uh, for all I know. And they just personally did me wrong in ways that I'm just not interested in forgiving them for. Uh, not until I could see that they had changed because they, what what those people, those those specific people that I've still got grudges with, um, you know, they would need to apologize. They would need to recognize the the wrongness of their actions and their attitude, right? And the and the and the real meanness that they brought to the picture because each one of these people were people that were not just people I didn't get along with. 
These were people who seemed to take pleasure in hurting other people. Um, so that's how my relationship with those people went, is I observed them abuse others repeatedly, caustically, and with enthusiasm. And they treated me the exact same way as they treated everybody else. I wasn't even somebody they were singling out. I was just one of many people that these folks had lined up and took great pleasure in. I mean, a real gusto in, in yelling at, that, at people and screaming at people, at putting them against a wall and forcing them to cower in terror and fear, at threatening them, carrying out those threats, right? Physical punishments, physical abuse, uh, uh, each one of these people. So, uh, you know, so why would I forgive them for any of that when they have demonstrated not one ounce of remorse uh, or, or sorrow or, or expressed any change in character or, or attitude, as far as I know? Um, you know, I'm, I, I feel zero obligation to, to forgive such people. I don't think about them anymore, though. I don't, I don't think about these grudges or they don't, they don't, you know, it doesn't chat my head. It doesn't like piss me off when I think about them. I mean, I've moved on. I, you know, this is not something that I, that I think about on a day-to-day -day basis, but, um, but were those people to re-enter my orbit in some fashion, they'd have some explaining to do. And, uh, and until they do, that's, that's kind of where that's at. Um, yeah. You know, as far as the, you know, what the, what my master's program, my master's program did a great deal for me in terms of understanding the victim victimizer problem, which I've talked about, you know, at the fact that, that there is a, a, a comeuppance, a, a real, a responsibility that one has to take as a former cult member for the abuse that one carried out against others, as well as the abuse one received. And it, and it goes both ways. And I will go out on a limb and say it will go both ways, you know, nearly 100% of the time for former cult members. You know, you get into these groups and you start describing to a, a very, very different morality and a very, very different way of thinking about the world where the end does justify the means. And so you start doing things and saying things to people and lying and actively deceiving people, for example, right almost right away. But it's for their good, see? You're convinced that, that you're doing these people a favor. You're helping people by lying to them, by deceiving them, by conning them into getting involved in something that you know is going to be the good thing for them, you see. So, so it can start with the best of intentions. It's not the intentions that, are, that, are, that is the problem. It's the actions. It's what you do with those beliefs and those ideas. And that's where things with cults go off the rails. And yet there are some people who get involved in these groups, and I believe there are some people who have a temperament or an attitude towards other people where they go into these groups like Scientology and they see the activity and the structure and the organization as enabling them to do what they already want to do, which is hurt other people. They want to abuse other people. They don't like other people. They, 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 other people annoy them or irritate them or, or they get pleasure from hurting others or dominating other people, right? That's, that, that's the evil that lives among us. That is that we, we know this is true. Well, such people can be wrangled into a cult just like anybody else through, you know, satisfaction of their emotional needs. And if their emotional needs are are all about being satisfied by inflicting pain and abuse on others, well, Scientology is certainly a great place to go to be able to whet your appetite that way and, and be able to carry out abuse against others. So, so th I believe that those people that I'm referring to that I've still got, you know, this, this issue with or whatever, um, are those kind of people. And percentages wise, that actually kind of works out too. I mean, we are talking about a very small number of people compared to the hundreds or even thousands of people over the years that I met and interacted with in Scientology. So, so, um, so that's my take on it right now as I sit here in episode, I think, number 332 or something. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's, that's, there you go. Duke of Chug. How does dating and romance work in the Sea Org? 
does Sea Org dating mostly consist of sharing meals together at the base's cafeteria? Do people mostly date coworkers within their specific unit, or is that discouraged because you'd be together 24-7? From how you've described life in the Sea Org, it seems like days off are rare and there's barely enough time to sleep, so it seems like meals would be the only time people would get to spend with their partners before marriage. On top of that, members barely get paid, so if they're lucky, they might get to buy fast food and go to the movies every few months. Also, when new people join, do they tend to get aggressively courted if they're young and or attractive? I'd imagine that old Ron didn't have a very modern workplace sexual harassment policy in place. Okay, Dayton in the Sea Org. This is actually pretty simple because um, it's no, it's not just during meal times that people can court. I mean, what you do is you make it work, and by that I mean you just stay up later, but it's on your own bat. Uh, you know, post time ends most frequently for Sea Org members around eleven, eleven thirty, you know, midnight, right around that time you're off. And if you want to get together and hang out in the stairwell and chat all night. People have done that, right? You take a walk around the block and another walk and another walk, you know, this kind of thing. You're not going to be up until two or three in the morning. Security is going to come give you a hard time. But if you hide out in the stairwells where it's not obvious that you're hanging out there and, you know, you're just chilling, smoking, talking, getting to know each other, you know, having flirty conversation. But it's a little out in the open where everybody can kind of see you're not sitting there doing, you know, out 2D stuff. In other words, no heavy petting. No heavy petting. So you might make out a little bit, you know, but there's no feeling each other up or anything like that. No hands on, you know, on, under the, the clothes or anything like that. I don't know now, right? Um, uh, but yeah, that does happen too. <laughs> in those dark corners of the bases where people will find each other. I mean, you got, you know, in the pack base, for example, you've got the stairwells of the main building. You've got the basement area. You've got a canteen and a cafeteria area where people will hang out and talk until late hours of the night. And they generally won't get rousted too badly unless it's like really late and security is like, hey, man, what the hell? Um, you know, it's kind of like, hey, you show up to post and get your work done. And, you know, nobody's really going to give you that much of a hard time about, um, you know, those dark circles under your eyes. Uh, because everybody does know that when it comes to courtship, that's the time you have. You don't have any other time. So, yeah, meal times and after post is it. You do have days off from time to time. I mean, there is the possibility in the Sea Org of having a day off every two weeks. And you can coordinate that and, and end up, you know, having dates where you actually get to go off base and, and be together. It's a lot harder to work out in the Sea Org logistically because if one, you know, because of the statistic problem and all the other issues and the emergencies that are always coming up. And the fact also that people can get sent off on missions and projects and frequently do. The only place this is ever really heavily discouraged is not within a unit because you're going to, that's what tends to happen is you're around the other people in your unit or area or division. And those are the people you tend to get friendly with and become really friendly with. So it's kind, it's not forbidden or verboten for people to hook up or start dating, in other words, when they are working together. Um, but where they have tried to draw lines or, or say no is when people move to different echelons. They don't want different command echelons getting together and sharing information. So people at the international level are not going to be, uh, it's not going to be encouraged or wanted that they be establishing relationships with people in lower echelons, for example. But the fact that people move around in the Sea Org all the time makes that a bit of an impractical rule to try to enforce, um, especially as there are less and less Sea Org members and more and more need for people in different places at different times. So people get transferred about. But when they do get transferred about, that also can end up being very hard on a married couple as a relationship because they can end up being apart for months or even years due to these physical separations from projects, missions, and post changes. So if anything, you kind of want to work out, you know, finding a partner that's somebody that has the same qualifications as you do as far as being able to be promoted. Uh, you know, and this is this uh, is a ridiculous thing to have to think about when you're uh, looking for a romantic partner, but this is the life in the Sea Org is that if you're hooking up with somebody who is probably going to get promoted up to int or has the potential to, you know, be a, a, a highly 
uh, promoted person and you're not because of your checkered past and that person doesn't have any checkered past, then you might end up having a senior person come around and talk to you and tell you, yeah, no, that's not going to work out. and No, you can't date them. It's happened. I've seen it. So, uh, so that's that's the kind of nonsense that goes on in that culture. It's um, it, there's a lot of balls in the air. You got to weigh when you're looking at you know how who you're going to be partnering up with there. Uh, so that's what I can say about that. As far as aggressively being courted when you get in, if you're young or attractive, yeah, of course that happens all the time. Uh, you know, new blood, uh, fresh blood arrives on the base, and you know all the guys or all the girls are like, oh. Uh, over this. I mean, I, I remember when I arrived on the base, uh, this is just stupid, but it happened. I mean, I was there and this girl was, uh, this woman was, was coming on to me pretty hard after I finished my EPF and started working on, on my post. And, um, and she wasn't somebody I was particularly attracted to, which really sucked because she was clearly coming, you know, after me. And uh, and I said something, and we, you know, we 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 stopped talking for a moment. And she went off, and she was saying to somebody else, I overheard her saying, oh, "I screwed up with the most eligible bachelor on the base," you know. And I this whatever, right? This is years ago. Um, but you, so you get that you do get that kind of thing going on, is where people are like, "Oh, I, I got to grab this person before anybody else grabs them," kind of thing, right? So sure, all the all the entanglements of of true love <laughs> in the Sea Org. There you go, Jerome Busca. Do you think the disintegration of traditional established religions, on the one hand, and the collapse of political ideologies such as Marxism, which had at their core hyper rational beliefs, on the other hand, could be a factor in promoting cults like Scientology? What I want to say is that religion fills a void in people's life. And the only reasonably mainstream, non-religious doctrine that could fill that void proved just as tainted as established religions, leaving people stranded. If true, this would go a long way toward explaining the resurgence of all sorts of pseudo-spiritual movements and the incredible success of self-help and spiritual gurus. Okay, um, there's a basic premise in your question here that I'm going to sort of... Uh, bring up and go, mm, I don't see it that way, which is you say uh, the disintegration of traditional established religions on the one hand. I I don't see a disintegration of traditional established religions uh, in, the, in the United States or in the world. We do see a reduction in the amount of people who are ascribing loyalty to or identifying as a particular brand of religion in the United States. We do have a, a decline in Christianity's numbers, but we don't see that that is a direct move over to atheism. That is also a move over away from, I don't really want to identify as a Protestant or an evangelical or a, a, a you know, a, a fifth wing Baptist or something. <laughs> You know, I just want to be spiritual. I'm spiritual, but not religious, right? This kind of very, you know, not airy fairy, but I should say much, much, much more broadly generalized category of, well, I've got some religious beliefs or I've got some spiritual ideas and nobody really seems to be nailing exactly how I feel or what I am. And so maybe a move away from organized religion in that sense. But again, it's a, it's not a huge, not like it's a flood of people leaving religion. And as you say, um, when people are stranded or, you know, there's this been this resurgence in pseudo-spiritual movements and self-help and all that. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it comes and goes, it's waves, right? Um, I mean, all the, the entire 20th century, all the 1900s from the beginning to the end, saw an incredible series of old spiritual occult ideas rehashed, rejuvenated, uh, and repackaged. Uh, the Secret, for example, right? That's, that's straight out of Madame Blavatsky stuff. Um, this, you know, the universe will provide if you, you know, send out good waves, you'll get good stuff back, all of that. This stuff is, these beliefs are as old as the hills. I mean, this stuff's been around for thousands of years. And um, and it's just a matter of really marketing and packaging is almost what we're seeing different these days with this stuff so much as as uh, as opposed to new different ideas. We haven't really seen anything new, truly new 
in spirituality or spiritualism or the occult in a very, very long time. And he was really just taking these same old, old school ideas and, you know, from what we're talking about, old uh, pre-Christian stuff. I mean, you can go all the way back to Zoroastrianism, or I always mispronounce that word horribly. Uh, you know, old, old stuff, right? Uh, old Book of the Dead stuff and the occult and the stuff that Blavatsky was plagiarizing from Gnosticism. I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of traditional stuff here. Um, and... It comes around and it goes around and it comes around and it goes around, right? So my my think about this is not we're seeing some big collapse right now. And I guess I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because I I know I've certainly talked about the decline and the statistics of, of a decline in, in uh, organized religion or organized religious belief. But that doesn't it, it, but that doesn't mean to me, my interpretation of that is not that people are moving away from religious ideals or ideas or beliefs, they're just moving away from unpleasant groups they don't want to be associated with or that they grew up with, realize that there was some abuse or some nonsense going on with it. Well, I don't really want to believe that. I don't want to think that way. But it doesn't change the fact that they still hold religious beliefs. Anyway, just wanted to, maybe maybe I'm going way overboard, you know, clarifying that. But um, but you asked here about uh, this idea of, of that people are are feeling left stranded, and that that is that is certainly true in everything I've just been describing and what you're what you're talking about here. I think that's the case. I think there is some existentialism going on there, some existential crises, so to speak. Um, does this explain the resurgence in pseudo spiritual movements and success of self help and spiritual gurus? Kind of. You know, um, the gurus and the spiritualists and the self-help guys promote themselves. They put themselves out there in a very big way. They spend a lot of money on promotion and marketing and trying to get new members and recruitment. So you and, and getting celebrities on board, for example. And I mean, we can go back to the Beatles with with meditation and the um, oh, I forgot the name of the guy they hooked up with, but they were um, kind of getting over into this Eastern stuff and that that kind of thing is what creates these huge you know, waves of popularity is when popular celebrities and the thought leaders or opinion leaders start becoming part of these movements or, or get, get hold of them. That's when uh, you start seeing mass changes and people coming on board this stuff. You know, Tom Cruise says, read a Scientology book. And that, that day, 5,000 copies of the book get sold, you know, because because one guy said, read a book, you know, so so it's influencers like that that have a big, big, big impact on on um, belief and, and cultural sway these days. But it's it, it, there's so many influencers and there's so much going on and we're under such a avalanche of information overload from all of this that it's a little hard to easily predict what's coming next. You know, people's needs are kind of funny because we don't always know or understand our own needs. And this is one of the most fascinating things about, about futurology and, 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 and future thinking and, and prediction is, is you're trying to put yourself in the headspace of a future person whose needs are being satisfied in a way that they didn't know they wanted need filled. In other words, nobody knew they wanted an iPad or an iPod until it was invented in, in a lot of ways. I mean, these, 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 this technology sort of, it, it, you know, it's, it, one leads the other in, in interesting ways. There's a, the, the, I, I'm sure there's a lot of philosophical uh, approaches to this, but I'm just sort of bringing this up that we don't always know what we want. In other words, we don't always have it clear in our heads where we're going or what's the next big thing. What's it going to be? We don't know. We don't know what we don't, we, we don't know what we, what, what is, what we want until somebody presents it and says, here, you want this? And we go, oh my God, I didn't know I wanted that. Yes, I very much want that. That's kind of what I'm, what I'm saying with that. And the same thing applies to religion, right? Where you have a need, you have these emotional, spiritual needs, you want them fulfilled, but you don't know what's going to fill, what's going to fill that bucket for you. And so, um, so these spiritual gurus and these guys who go out and, and put themselves out there and say, well, this is what you need. And people, a lot of people will look at that and go, well, maybe that's not exactly what I had in mind, but it's closer than anything else anybody else is showing me. So I'm going to take that. 
and and that's how people get on board with Tony Robbins or you know these these guys, right? Uh, okay, so yeah, I don't know, just some commentary on that. I you know probably not as well thought out an answer as I could have given you, but I hope that's at least a little bit of food for thought for you. Holly Prevenkel, have you ever looked at stss.nl? This is a website run by an independent Scientologist, which has many of Hubbard's materials that one would normally have to pay for, including lectures and PDFs. There is even a seven or eight gigabyte file with all old and new policy and technical volumes. What's your opinion on the site? Hey, Holly, thank you for this question. I use the site. I have downloaded almost everything it has to offer uh, because when I left Scientology, I took hardly anything with me and I did not have an extensive library of all the books and lectures and everything. And the stuff that I had, I pretty much left there with my ex-wife. So I um, needed to rebuild a library in order to be able to commentate on it and uh, educate all of you folks about it. So, uh, so I went to sites like this and other places where there are downloads. Wikipedia was also a great source of uh, downloaded information for me. And I have an incredibly extensive library now. And I've also engaged in scanning material myself. I've got a flatbed scanner and a couple other scanning things. And I've, I've uh, taken, uh, you know, all the new basic lectures and congresses, all kinds of stuff that, that I've uh, managed to beg, steal, or borrow and uh, put together for myself. So, um, so yeah, so I, so I know about that. And if you're curious or interested in finding things, uh, finding the works of L. Ron Hubbard and old and new, then sites like that provide a great service. Uh, and, you know, I definitely have to admit that I have taken advantage of that. Uh, that's not an endorsement of independent Scientology, though. It's really just a matter of that's where I could find the data. You know, if it wasn't there, I would have had to go to used bookstores or I would have had to go around and, and find the materials hard copy somehow. And I would have done that instead, you know, but this was a lot more convenient. So that's what I can say about that. All right, and that is our show for this week. Thank you very much for coming around and listening to me babble on here. I hope my answers were, like I said, at least interesting food for thought for you. And I hope that I am providing some information in an educational and entertaining way. And if I am, consider supporting the channel. All right, guys, I will see you next week. Bye-bye.